first up is Jonathan. <laughs> um, so Jonathan also attends Harvard University. He's a fourth year PhD candidate in statistics. Uh, he's advised by Dr. Mark Glickman and Dr. Luke Mirtrix. His research interests include Bayesian modeling and causal inference with applications to both sports and social science. Um, and he is, the name of it, the talk he's presenting today is Athlete Rating in Multi-Competitor Games with Scored Outcomes via Monotone Transformations. Uh, so whenever you're ready, Jonathan, take it away. Fantastic, thanks for the introduction. Um, and uh, thanks for the, the chance to speak at this conference. Um, I will do my best to get this going. Cool. Uh, is my screen showing fine for everyone? Yep, good. you're good. Fantastic. All right, so today I'll be talking about a project I've been working on with uh, Mark for a while now about rating athletes who compete in uh, multi-competitor games with scored outcomes. The funding and data for this project have come from the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee, so a huge shout out and thank you to them for doing that. Um, yeah, I'll just hop right in. So let's see. I think it makes sense to just you know jump directly into the problem of athlete rating. That's at the core of this project. When rating athletes, our question is simple, right? How do we translate an athlete's observed athletic performances into some sort of summary of how good that athlete really is? Um, you know, you guys know better than me why this is interesting, but there are all sorts of reasons why I'd want to do this, right? From trying to figure out who's most likely to medal in the next Olympic games to you know, trying to settle a kitchen table argument. And as I'm sure many of you know, um, athlete rating is a well-studied problem. Most of you might be familiar with ELO or Mark's Glico or whatever 538's up to. Um, and the details of those systems aren't important for this project in particular, but they do capture the basic idea behind athlete rating. So you know, imagine we have two competitors in a single game. Uh, before the game, we think the one in red up top is a bit weaker and the one in blue down bottom is a bit stronger, maybe they're fencing. <clears throat> and after they play the game, we get a winner and a loser. Um, in this case, we get an upset. We then update our best guess of each athlete's latent ability. So you know, maybe here we'd increase the winner's rating and decrease the loser's rating. Different rating systems will do different types of math to figure out how to move ratings around, um, but the idea is the same. Just as a note, uh, general methods like ELO have been tweaked for particular use cases in all sorts of different sports. And uh, in this talk, I'll just be introducing a broad framework for athlete rating that isn't optimized for any particular sport, because the focus here is to develop a method that can help the USOPC rate athletes across all of their many, many different sporting events. This broad range of events introduces two wrinkles that aren't addressed by standard methods like ELO. The first wrinkle is that a lot of Olympic sports have many competitors in each event, not just two. So instead of a head-to-head -head game like fencing, you might have a game like the mile run, where a bunch of athletes will compete at the same time, or a game like diving, where you're comparing results across many athletes. Of course, head-to-head -head games are just special cases of these multi-competitor competitions with two athletes instead of many. Um, but in any case, this means that we generally don't just get a single winner and single loser. Um, instead, we get outcomes for each competitor, and we have to figure out how to translate those into ratings and rating changes. To handle multiple competitors, um, Mark and Jonathan Hennessy in a previous project developed a rank-ordered logit model to estimate latent athlete abilities over time. The model is trained on athlete rank placements in each event, and it uses those to infer their true latent abilities. So in this example here, um, we'd see that this athlete came in first place, this athlete in second, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we'd use that information to adjust each athlete's rating. This method works well, um, but from sort of a big picture perspective, we're losing some information by reducing our data to rank outcomes. And this is the second wrinkle. Um, in many games, we actually have score information in addition to rank information. This might be athlete race times or points or things like that. Um, and here I've assigned some fake scores. And in this case, the score information suggests that you know, maybe the first place athlete is much stronger than the next three, who might be pretty similar in terms of strength even though the raw ranks would just indicate the same gap between first and second, second and third, and so on. The goal of this project is to carefully use score information to infer latent athlete abilities in multi-competitor games. Hopefully, the thought is using scores instead of ranks 
can help improve model performance beyond what we can get from the Glickman and Hennessy model. Okay, so now we'll talk about the model that we developed to rate athletes in these multi-competitor games with scored outcomes. Our model is a dynamic linear model, uh, or a DLM for short, and DLMs have been used to rate athletes for a while now. Um, I've put some of the more foundational references for DLMs in sports, specifically American football, at the top of this slide. Um, but regardless, I'll give a quick intro for those of us who haven't seen them before. The goal here is to learn athletes' latent abilities over time. So the red dots on this chart uh, represent a single athlete's latent ability, and we see that it changes over time, you know, maybe due to training or injuries. And unfortunately, we can't directly observe an athlete's latent ability, right? We, instead, we can only observe their performances as represented by their scores in athletic events. And we generally expect an athlete's scores at each time point to be close to their latent ability at the time, right? But the scores are allowed to vary up and down depending on just how well they perform in each event. So the bars here just represent a range where we'd expect an athlete's actual scores to fall, you know, most of the time. Dynamic linear models just sort of formalize the intuition where observed outcomes are noisy realizations of latent parameters that evolve over time. And this gives us a statistical framework that we can then use to infer those unobservable latent abilities using observed outcomes. So now this slide is the exact same thing as the previous slide, just translated into math. Um, and here we're looking at a standard DLM for a single athlete participating in the GF game within the TF time period. And we're thinking of time periods as like sporting seasons or years. The first equation is our model likelihood, which just represents each of those error bars we saw on the previous slide. And for a single athlete, we modeled their observed score y in game g and time t as a normal distribution centered at theta t, which is their latent ability um, in time period t. And the variance of the observed scores around the latent ability is the observation variance parameter sigma squared. So for example, the likelihood says that the time in seconds it takes an athlete to run a mile is normally distributed around their latent ability parameter um, with some observation variance. The second equation is our innovation equation, and it represents the connections between the points that we saw on the previous slide. And we'll model changes in latent abilities over time as just a normal random walk. So at each new time point, each athlete's new ability parameter theta t plus one is a random step from their previous ability parameter. The size of the step is gonna be drawn from a normal with variance related to the observation variance by W, which is a hyperparameter for us to tune. And lastly, uh, I'll be using a Bayesian framework here. So I need to put some standard conjugate prior distributions on sigma squared and the initial distribution of latent athlete abilities. These priors are pretty weak, so they quickly get dominated by the data. In summary, the main point of this slide is the two equations at the top that describe how scores are produced and how athletes evolve over time. And I won't bore you with the details, but if we assume that these equations are true as is, the so-called common filter equations give us closed form solutions for the posterior means and variances of the theta and sigma parameters. And the common filter is super quick to compute, which is a big reason behind why DLMs ended up being so popular. So. <clears throat> Of course, we're not super happy with these two equations as is. Um, and for a project, we make two modifications to the vanilla DLM. The first one's pretty standard. So let's again take the mile run example. Um, one concern that might pop up is, you know, what if it's extremely hot on the race day? Then we'd expect that, you know, all the athletes in the game might race more slowly, right? Uh, regardless of their latent ability. So we might see this ad upward shift in the average race time that's not captured by our simple model here. And in general, you know, all sorts of game specific effects might shift scores for a particular game up or down. People usually account for these game to game shifts with an intercept term in the likelihood, um, but for computational reasons I won't get into here, we instead decided to game center the scores and then to model them using game centered latent abilities. Here, Y bar is just the average of all scores for players in game G and time period T, and theta bar is the same for players latent ability parameters. So instead of directly saying that observed scores are centered around latent ability parameters, we say that the relative observed scores are centered around the relative latent ability parameters, where everything is relative to the game level average. And using relative scores basically does what an intercept would do, since we're subtracting out the game specific averages that might change from game to game. Um, but it also means that we need to use relative latent ability parameters to encode the fact that, you know, for example, we'd expect an athlete with a rating of theta equals 100 to have a higher than average scores when competing against a bunch of people with around rating 80 and lower than average scores when competing against 120s. 
The second concern that springs to mind is bigger, um, and it's with the model itself. So in particular, the normal distribution in the likelihood might raise some alarms. We pick the normal distribution for ease of computation, um, but you know, in general, we might suspect that athletes' relative scores are not normally distributed around the relative latent ability parameters, particularly because we're applying this model to all sorts of sport games. And indeed, when we try fitting this DLM to some data and we compare a histogram of our standardized residuals to the red normal distribution curve, we can see that, okay, our residuals, definitely not normal. Um, and this problem of a misspecified normal likelihood was the main problem we set out to tackle in this project. And we do so using transformations. The big idea is simple. And if you've taken a regression course, you've seen it all before. All we have to do is transform the data to better match our normal model, just like we do for regular re linear regression. Um, and here we transform the game-centered scores using our transformation T that's parameterized by a vector of hyperparameters lambda. Before we think about how to tune lambda, let's look at two classes of transformations I'll be considering. The first class of transformations is, you might be familiar, it's a class of Yeo-Johnson transformations introduced in 2000, uh, which are parameterized by a single scalar lambda. I've written the mathematical form of the transformation up top, and down below I've just plotted what the transformation does at two different values of lambda, um, where the dotted line is the identity line, y equals x, and the solid line is the transformation function. And we see that the Yo Johnson transformation basically allows us to sort of stretch or shrink the tails of our data, which is nice in many applications. More generally, though, the only constraint we need on our transformations is that we want them to be monitored, right? Transforming the data should never change the ordering of the scores, only their relative spacing. And so to give ourselves more flexibility, the second class of transformations we consider is the class of monotone spline transformations. And these were first introduced by Ramsey in 1988. And the details that aren't important, but basically monotone splines are regression splines built from an I-spline basis. And they're super nice for us because they're easily parameterized by a lambda vector of length big B, where B is the number of basis functions, which just depends on the degree and number of knots we choose for, choose for the spline. Um, and then importantly though, if we constrain all the lambda values to be positive, the resulting transformation will always be monotone increasing. And so down below, again, I've just plotted a bunch of examples of monotone splines with various lambda parameters. And as you can see, monotone splines can take on the shape of basically any monotone function. Um, and we can make them even wigglier if we want by increasing the number of basis functions. Okay, so now we have our model and we have our parameterized transformations. The next big question is, how do we fit it? Um, in particular, how are we supposed to learn the transformation parameters lambda from our data? So just for reference, here's our final model again. And just for convenience, I'll shorthand the transformed game-centered outcomes as psi t. And so now our goal is to fit our model, right? To get estimates of our parameters theta, sigma, lambda, and w. As with any statistical model, we can start by writing down the full joint distribution of our data and our parameters. Um, it looks a bit scary, but we do see all our old friends, right? So down here, we have the likelihoods and the innovation equations from our time periods one through T, um, all multiplied together. And then up top, we have priors for the other parameters. And you'll notice now that we have priors on the innovation variance parameter W and the transformation parameter lambda, um, since we're treating them as regular model parameters. The one new bit I'd like to highlight here is this Jacobian term. And so because we're working with transformations, it's super important to have this Jacobian around to appropriately account for how our transformations are rescaling the data. Instead of looking at the joint distribution, I'll put the graphical version of our model up, um, which I find a bit easier on the eyes. And so if you haven't seen these before, you can read it sort of from left to right with the latent abilities theta at each time point, depending on the thetas at the previous time point. Um, according to our innovation equation, and the transformed observed scores at each time point, the size, depending on their respective thetas, and that's the model likelihood equation. And again, we're working with innovation framework, so our goal is to figure out the joint posterior distribution of our parameters. Unfortunately, no nice conjugate priors for the W and lambda exists, so we'd have to use MCMC sampling to do this, which would be extremely computationally expensive. Um, the USOPC has many sports to keep constant tabs on, um, and so we don't want the model fitting process for each one to take hours to run. Luckily for us, under our DLM framework, it turns out we can derive a closed form expression for the marginal posterior distribution of just W and lambda, with all the theta and sigma parameters integrated out. 
And directly integrating these parameters out is nice because it means that our marginal posterior fully accounts for sort of the posterior uncertainty in the distributions of the theta and sigma parameters. And just in a bit more detail, um, this first line up here is the marginal posterior distribution of W and lambda, which is what we wish to evaluate. And we do so by using the Coleman filter to help integrate the theta and sigma parameters out of the joint to posterior distribution, which gives us this final expression. Um, and we can see that this final expression just involves the ever important Jacobian of the transformation, the priors on W and lambda, which we normally just take to be flat, and this product of posterior predictive distributions, um, which turn out to be shifted and scaled T distributions uh, with parameters that we can pull out from running the Kalman filter. And so most importantly, we can directly evaluate this expression for any given value of W and lambda. And to do so, you first transform a data according to lambda, and then we sort of run it through our usual Kalman filter computations with the given W hyperparameter. Then we can just evaluate each of these three terms to compute the marginal posterior density. And so armed with this closed form expression for the posterior density of W and lambda, we can now learn our transformation and the innovation variance parameters from the data. And just to be clear about what we're doing, uh, we decided to take an MAP approach and just shoot to find the posterior mode of W and lambda instead of the full distribution. And so this turns things into a standard constraint optimization problem uh, that you can feed into any optimization software, where we're trying to find the positive values of W and lambda that maximize the marginal posterior. And so essentially what will happen is that the optimization algorithm will carefully pick a candidate value of W and lambda. It'll evaluate the marginal posterior at that value using the procedure I showed on a previous slide. Um, and then it'll repeat this process until it converges to a maximizing value. And technically, we could do MCMC sampling and get the full posterior distribution of W and lambda, but we're not super interested in the full distribution, right? We really only need a single good estimated transformation and innovation variance parameter. And then once we have our best transformation, we can just use it to transform our data and feed it into the original standard DLM framework um, with the best W as a hyperparameter to get our usual Kalman filter estimates for the theta and sigma parameters. Okay, so that's our model. Um, based on a standard DLM framework, we're able to additionally learn both the transformation and the innovation variance that makes the model best fit uh, the observed data. Okay, so now let's see the model in action. This first slide is just a sanity check. We ran on some simulated data to sort of show that our method kind of works. Um, we simulate data according to our model's data generating process under a variety of true data generating transformations that we know because we're simulating. Um, and then we try to recover those true data generating transformations using the monotone spline transformation. Here, we're just trying to recover some Yo Johnson and sort of tangent arc tangent functions that just are sort of weird functions that are supposed to represent a variety of potential transformations and shapes that we might have to learn with real data. The true data generating transformations are plotted in gray and the recovered monotone spline transformations are plotted in red. In all of these cases, you know, we basically just see a single line since the monotone spline gets the shape of the transformation pretty much correct. I should note here that there's sort of a bias variance trade-off sort of flavored thing here. Um, if we want to allow the monotone spline to recover weirder, wigglier transformations, we can increase the number of basis functions and lambda parameters, um, but this comes at the cost of increasing the number of dimensions in the optimization, which makes it harder. We stick with seven lambda hyperparameters for a nice balance, um, but that number can be tuned. Okay, so great. Our model seems to work for some nice simulated data. Um, obviously, the more interesting test is to compare our model to other existing methods using some real data. And for these comparisons, we consider um, two other models. We'll consider a baseline vanilla DLM where we just tune W and don't have any transformations, which I'll abbreviate as VLM, as well as the Glickman and Hennessy rank order logit model that I mentioned in the introduction, um, which I'll abbreviate as ROL. Before looking at these results, I'll note that we're doing the appropriate train test splits. So we use the first two thirds time periods in our data set to run our hyperparameter tuning algorithm. And then once we have our best estimates, you know, lambda hat, w hat for w and lambda, um, we fit the model on the full data set and only evaluate our predictions in the last third, which was never seen during training. We'll be looking at data from five sports today, um, three multi-competitor and two head to head. The USOPC gave us data spanning from roughly 04 to 2019 with all sorts of you know, major national and international competitions included for these sports. 
The multi-competitor sports are diving, where we use total points as our score, and two biathlon events, the individual biathlon and the national biathlon relay. And if you're not familiar with the biathlon, it's a sport where you cross-country ski between rifle shooting stations, and you have to sort of shoot accurately enough at each station to continue on the course. And the score we'll use for those is the total time and seconds it takes each competitor to finish the course. The head-to-head -head sports are rugby and fencing, uh, where we just use the usual point totals for our competitors um, as our scores. So here are the results for the multi-competitor data sets. Um, we compute Spearman and Kendall correlations for each game, uh, comparing the observed ranks in the game to the predicted ranks for the game under the model, where the predictions are made using data only up to the previous time period. We then summarize the game correlations using this sort of game size weighted average um, in this ugly formula to get the numbers in the table. So in the table, again, VLM is the vanilla DLM, LMT is our DLM with transformations, and ROL is the rank order logic model. Higher numbers are better, and I've bolded the best model performances for each sport. And just as a note before I look at the numbers, um, while our model can predict relative scores, um, the rank order logit model can only predict rankings. So our metrics have to be rank based if we want to compare things. This means that you know, maybe these metrics don't fully characterize what the LMT can get up to, um, but they're good enough for now. Okay, the major takeaway is that all three of these models exhibit remarkably similar performances across the three multi-competitor sports. The differences in the performances come in the second decimal place, so we really shouldn't read too much into them. You know, a few strange outcomes or games in the test set could throw things off. This is obviously disappointing, um, given that I've spent the past 20 minutes telling you about our new method. But regardless, I think there are still a lot of interesting results here. So I'll spend the next, you know, five or 10 minutes trying to assuage this disappointment, and hopefully you'll end up agreeing with me. So for example, we see that the ROL model does slightly better for the biathlon and the LMT does slightly better for the biathlon relay. The biathlon relay data set is smaller than the biathlon data set. And I don't have full results yet, so I'll say this next line a bit quietly, but in my experiences, the LMT model does generally outperform the ROL model for smaller data sets. And this at least makes intuitive sense, right? When we have many, many comparisons between a bunch of athletes, we can start to infer the relative skill gaps just by looking at their raw ranks, right? If someone's always winning, we can assume, okay, they're probably much better than everyone else. When we don't have a lot of comparisons, however, that's where the score differences can sort of help us out a lot more in giving us that information. We also see that for diving, the vanilla DLM performs the best, and interestingly enough, the transformation actually seems to hurt our predictions, at least according to these metrics. And I'll come back to this shortly. Here are the results for the head-to-head -head, uh, sports. The metric is now accuracy of winner predictions, and I'm comparing the DLMs to Glico, abbreviated GLO, which is just a slightly modified version of ELO. The story here is much the same as the previous slide. You know, all three models perform roughly the same, though we see that you know maybe LMT has a slight edge here. So what are our initial conclusions? We saw that it was hard to do much better than the ROL model for our data sets, and Intuitively, for sports like the biathlon, you know, rankings may actually do a pretty good job of measuring skill, right? If athletes are racing against each other to get a good rank and not necessarily just trying to go as fast as they can, just keeping the rank information might be good enough. We also saw some initial evidence that scores could help more in low data settings. Um, and when we have a lot of data, again, we can get enough different athlete ranking comparisons to get a good idea of the gaps between athlete skills. Um, so we don't gain as much from also seeing scores. In other words, just because we don't see big gains in these particular sports doesn't mean that we won't see gains in other settings, perhaps with more score-focused games or fewer games overall. Um, but regardless, we might still want to ask if the LMT has you know, any other nice features that might make it more useful to an analyst. Obviously, since I'm asking the question, um, the answer I think is yes. And the first sort of cool thing we can do is to make posterior predictive intervals to predict athletes' relative scores in a new event. And so here I've just plotted our posterior predictive intervals for five events in the biathlon relay data. The x-axis is model score, is actual score, sorry, and the y-axis is the model's prediction. And I'm plotting 95% intervals on these predictions. So we want 95% of our intervals to cover the actual score, i.e. to cross the red y equals x line. You see that for event number five in the top left corner, um, we haven't really seen enough data yet to do that well. But by the time we make it to event number 80, our predictions are lining up fairly well with the truth. 
Uh, just as a note, these intervals are on the transform scale, um, but we can make them also on the original scale of the data, which is sometimes easier to interpret. Posterior predictive intervals are nice to have because they help us probabilistically forecast you know, how well athletes might perform in future events relative to their competition. And I'm not showing these plots here, but the intervals are empirically well calibrated when the model residuals look good. Um, in other words, our 95% or 80% or whatever percent predictive intervals actually cover the true relative scores precisely as often as advertised, um, which is really helpful. And so speaking of residuals, uh, let's look at some residual plots. Here I'm plotting the standardized residuals on the test set for the DLM without on the left and with transformations for the biathlon data set. Um, if the model fits well, the residual should match uh, the red normal curve. In this example, uh, the transformation sort of fixes the extreme low tail of the residuals. And the result is that our new model, our LMT model, fits super well. Um, this means that uh, our LMT posterior predictive intervals um, actually turn out to be well calibrated, i.e. you know, actually useful for an analyst, um, unlike the intervals we got from the LM. And here are the residuals for the diving data set that, if you recall, LMT sort of struggled with. The LMT residuals we see on the right, they're slightly better than the VLM residuals, but you know, they're still not perfect. We see that extreme observations in the training data are still inflating our estimated observation variance, which leads to this sort of peaked behavior in the standardized residuals on the test set. Of course, the data don't have to match the model to get good predictions, right? The VLM on the left, we can see has a horrible fit to the data, but as we saw, it still made pretty good point predictions. The bad model fit just means that we shouldn't trust any of the model inferences. Um, and basically, we can see that the LMT performs poorly on the diving data because it's doing its best to try to transform the data to match our hypothesis model, or our hypothesized model, um, but it doesn't quite get there. And in this sort of unhappy medium, there's no saying whether the resulting point predictions will be better or worse than the VLMs. The second sort of cool thing that pops out from the LMT is just the transformation that gets learned um, on its own. And here I've plotted out the transformations that the LMT learns for our five data sets compared to the dashed y equals x line. And the shapes of these transformations turn out to match our intuitions about how scores in these sports should roughly translate into skill. So for the biathlon and biathlon relay in the top left, our transformation is shrinking down high values, right? Which suggests that the really slow times in the data set aren't indicative of really bad skill, but rather of sort of this negative feedback loop or sort of giving up effect. And in the biathlon, if you don't shoot accurately enough, it turns out you have to take a penalty lap or get bonus time added to your total, depending on the rule set. And so this means that when athletes get really, really slow times, it's usually not because they're really, really unskilled, but rather because you know they accidentally accrued a few penalties and got more tired or sort of stopped trying after that. Um, and our model learns to account for this. For the diving data set, our transformation seems to be really splitting the low values from the high values. And the diving data are a bit weird because we're recording total score added up across rounds, but the structure of the competitions means that only the top performers in each round can make it to the next round. The transformation sort of tries to reflect this, where it says that athletes with really, really low scores who get eliminated early are truly weak, but the athletes with moderate scores who get eliminated in later rounds are stronger than their scores may reflect. For fencing, our transformation seems to be sort of stretching out the ends, which means by that winning by a lot means that you're really much stronger than your opponent. And this makes a lot of sense um, because fencers start from even ground for each round and they fence until someone wins 15 rounds, at least in the data set that we're using. Winning by a lot means that you're consistently beating your opponent, which suggests a significant gap in skill. And then finally for rugby, uh, we see roughly the identity transformation, suggesting that score gaps in rugby are roughly reflective of skill gaps. And you know, this explains why the VLM and LMT have such similar performances, and also why they both seem to be able to marginally outperform the ROL model. Um, just as a final note, this is a slide to show that like the VLM and ROL models, the LMT can also plot athlete strengths with uncertainty over time. Um, here I'm just plotting the estimated strengths of three athletes in our biathlon data. And here the strengths are smooth so that the inferred strength at each point is using information from the full data set. Using relative scores means that, you know, zero is a nice reference point for skill. So for example, your theta mean being below zero means that you're consistently producing scores lower than those produced by the average athlete. And for the biathlon, you know, having low scores is good because we're using total seconds to complete the course. So we see, for example, athlete number 32 started off super strong and sort of got weaker over time. Okay. 
Um, and that's all I have for this talk. Um, in this talk, I introduced a dynamic linear model that uses a transformation to better fit the data. Um, I described the model, showed a simple algorithm for fitting it that uses the standard common filter updates within a constrained optimization loop. We then looked at some real data and saw that while it was difficult to, for the RO, uh, to outperform the ROL model in terms of correlation for some of our data sets, there is reason to think that you know, maybe the LNT could do better in other settings. And then finally, we saw how the LNT can help us in other ways, you know, such as showing us informative transformations and giving us statistically reliable diagnostic and inferential tools. Um, and so here are the references I cited. Um, we're hopefully gonna have a paper draft at some point out in the archive in, in the near future. Um, and thank you for your time. Um, and I might have time for a question or two here. I'm not sure. <laughs> Thanks for the talk, Jonathan. Uh, yeah, definitely have time for a question, a quick question or two. Um, if anyone has a question, you can either type it into the question and answer uh, portion on the bottom of your Zoom chat, Zoom screen, or you can raise your hand um, and ask it. If you put it in the chat too. Oh, also in the chat, yeah. Multimedia question. All right, well, I have um, one question uh, to kind of start us off. Uh, so Jonathan, it looks like when you modeled um, the like the scores conditional on player athlete skill, you use the same um, like standard deviation for all athletes. Um, do you notice that there's any evidence that different athletes might have uh, different like sorry, like different variations? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a super interesting question. Um, I haven't actually had the chance to sort of go through and look into that. Um, I think. There's definitely ways to extend the model. Um, I worry that it would make the sort of inner loop much more inefficient, which would sort of blow up the, the time it takes to fit. Um, but for some sports, it might make a lot more sense to try to extend the model that way. Yeah, great suggestion. Um, and if I have another question, if. <laughs> If uh, no one else has one, um, I'll give you guys a few more, maybe one more minute to type one in. Uh, so for the, I'm not super familiar with the transformation you used, but I was curious if it worked well, if you had um, like a game where scores were always very close to zero or um, were just really heavily skewed or had, or even like a lot of scores at zero or just were had a really heavy skew because of that. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, there are some, things that pop up when all your scores are sort of clumped at the same point, because it just makes it hard to set the spline knot. So like if, you know, most of your data is just at zero, like where do I put this knot? Um, it, it's hard to sort of spread them out across the data to like get a nice transformation. Um, otherwise, I feel like the, the monotone spline, it's sort of finicky, but it behaves fairly nicely in most settings that I've seen. Um, it, does what's advertised um, and doesn't doesn't complain too much based on the shape of the data or the transformation that it has. And we do have one question. Um, uh, Stuart Pesco is asking if considering Mark's involvement, did you try this on chess data? Um, <laughs> good point. Um, so I guess the nice part about this is that we're learning transformations for sort of games with scored outcomes and with chess, Typically, it's win loss. I guess you can use some like engine evaluations to try to determine, you know, how much a player won by, um, and so that could be an interesting direction to poke into. Um, but the focus here was on games that had outcomes that were scores that we can then sort of use to learn this transformation. Uh, cool. Thanks, Jonathan. Oh, do we have time for one more question mark, or do you want to? Yeah. Okay. Last Give me question. One last one. Um, so, how does this? uh so how does this apply to elimination style games where the better players get to play more um so can you uh, up, can you update within a tournament so yeah can you use this for like a tournament bracket tell? yeah that's a that's a great question so i mean technically you can just sort of input new rounds as like new games of data and it would just learn and update things um and you could go from there we saw in the diving data set where it's sort of this elimination style thing where you have to make it to each round. Um, we struggled a bit. And I think part of that was we're trying to use as much information as possible from the data. And so we're trying to include all the people who got eliminated early and the people who got eliminated in the middle. Um, but it's hard to sort of go backwards and sort of impute points for those people that got eliminated, right? Um, you know, if we only see that they made it into the second round and then got eliminated, 
you know, we're not going to want to say that all of the people who got eliminated in the second round scored the same um, because they obviously had some variation. And we also don't want to say that, you know, they may be uniformly varied or whatever. Um, and so in terms of these sort of elimination style games where we only see outcomes um, after the whole thing is said and done and we only see like scores for the top athletes, um, we have to think a lot harder about how to sort of go backwards and impute correct scores to be using for the, the, the athletes that we don't get to observe. Yeah, that was I'll, Yeah. Go. I'll just add very quickly that the, that the likelihood principle basically says that, um, that as long, you know, the, the data that you, um, that you observe is the data that you should be analyzing in the sense that as long as you don't think that players' abilities, players are not like overperforming or underperforming on average relative to like the early parts of a tournament where you, before they get eliminated, then all the information that you're collecting based on the game outcomes is just legitimate to use as is. It is still a question whether um, you know, people that do well in an early part of a tournament where they, they move on and other people are eliminated are actually not performing, they're performing better than, than what their, you know, the prior distribution says about them. That, that becomes an issue. But if you, if you really believe that people are performing at the level that they're expected to perform on average based on their abilities, you wouldn't expect new and you wouldn't expect um, the differential of having more information about some players more than others to affect your inferences. But it is it, it is sort of a, a complicated issue. Okay. Um, and there's that's it for questions.